Hey, I'm just gonna warn you. If you don't follow at Torre and you decide to, be forewarned that you will get lost on his Twitter account. This man can cover every topic exceptionally well. He's about to join us in a second. But he tweeted this earlier and this jumped out to me going back to our COVID conversation. The number of people who have lost their lives because of COVID, considering the broad implications it's had on society, is way, way more than 260,000. And he makes a great point. Uh, speaking from experience, I know of an older man, a family friend who went to the hospital. Doctors thought he had COVID, treated him for that, missed his real trouble. He died. Didn't die because of COVID, but it made treating him harder he won't be counted among COVID deaths, but it's, of course, a factor. And it's like I was saying a little while ago. It's those 260,000 lives and counting loss, but also livelihoods that are being compromised, if not lost, uh, as well. And author, podcaster, got the dopest podcast out. It gets anybody who's anybody joins uh, Torre Show. Author, podcaster, cultural critic, host, dad, just the man. Torre is here. And Michael Holly's already kissing up. I'm going to just lay out because these two brilliant authors are about to have a conversation, and no, no, I can't no. hold a candle to either one of them, so I'm going to chill. No, no, there's one brilliant author. There's one brilliant author here. It's this man. I got this book from Porter Square Books in Cambridge. You know, you know the area. I know you do. Hell, and hell yeah. uh, it is not signed. It is red. It is dog-eared. It's got notes. Uh, I've stolen some stuff out of it um, and, and, and <laughs> pass it off as my own. See if Michael Smith can pick it up. He's like, man, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. I, but that's a good point, Michael. But, uh, hey, brother, I'm so glad that you're on here. It's an honor uh, just to Thank be able you. to yeah, be man. in conversation with you. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It, it, you know, your your books are like your children. So to have somebody be like, yeah, I hung out with your son and we had a nice time. It's like, oh, wow. Thank you so <laughs> I <did> much. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I want to jump into the last conversation because y'all were dumping all the trash on Scott Atlas. And yes, he's trash. But not all of them. Many other people could have sat in that position. The problem yeah. goes back yeah. even deeper. And it predates Trump in the right wing in the Republican Party's systematic uh, uh, d disbelief in science, in mm. media, and in the Democratic Party. In them teaching their people, you can't believe science, you can't believe media, you can't believe the Democratic Party. And mm. when COVID happened, it was this perfect storm that fell into all three of those things. When the scientists, the media, and the Democratic Party are telling you, this is a major problem, <laughs> <laughs> and they're right. like, well, we've been trained to not listen to any of those people. <laughs> and they're right. all lying to us. So, right. And they're all together? They must be lying yeah. to us. And right. you see right now, I just looked this up the other day, the top 14 states in terms of infections right now, only three are blue states, right? And the top mm. 10 is only one blue state, right? The red states are exploding with COVID right now. Um, it, Scott Atlas was just the newest cog in the it's machine. A manifestation. He was a manifestation Absolutely. of all those things you're talking about. Yeah. Trump yeah. and the right, and Trump gave up the game, I believe, to Leslie Stahl, not the last Leslie Stahl interview, the previous one, where he told you, um, I tell you this about media. I tell my people this about media so that if they want to report about me, I can say, like, oh, well, you know, they always lie. You don't have to believe them. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the, the notion that we are both in bubbles, the left and the right, I find highly offensive. And it's a both sidesism that masks the truth. I'm on the left, I'm a progressive, I'm not in a bubble. There is nothing that I believe where there are experts, the entire community of experts in a given area that are saying, that is not true. Nearly everything that the right holds as a critical sacrament to their belief system is said to be not true by a community of experts, be it climate change, be it taxation policy, be it immigration, uh, be it race, be it the way we deal with voting in this election. Now they want to talk, of, I mean, like a lot of Republicans believe that we had significant election fraud in this election. It's just not true. But they've been yeah. trained to believe that. I, I, 
I don't understand how they keep accepting this stuff with no evidence. They never, oh, wait, it's a cult. That's why they believe it. I mean, that's what, it, that's what you would see, right? When you have a singular leader telling you, believe my reality and don't believe anyone else's reality, including that of scientists, media, or regular thoughtful people, elites who understand and study and academics. And like, that's a cult. And, and you know, we say that and it comes off as a pejorative, but the way that the Republican Party is functioning right now- It is walks like a duck, too, right? It, right? It walks and like a duck, the, it, it quacks the, like a duck. <laughs> the, the left is simply not functioning like that. And, and so when people say we're both in our own bubbles, it obscures the truth that the right is in a bubble where uh, reality is not really permeating. The election was not stolen. Masks really work. Climate change is yeah. really happening. Hey, the yeah. truth is, immigration has been at a net negative for a decade. More people are leaving here and going back to Mexico than coming here. So the notion that they're streaming across the border, which is what one of my uncles, black gay man in Massachusetts who supports Trump, told me. Why? Because they're streaming across the border. I'm like, yo, it's not true at all. But you know, this is what we're dealing with. So it's hard to even bubble, deal with them because they're not dealing with reality. But I, but I like that bubble point because we'd be so lucky to be in a bubble in so much as a bubble could actually protect you. Because that if, if, if they were in a bubble and, that, and their behavior was only affecting them, okay, that's one thing. But unfortunately, we have to be uh, at the mercy of, of all that denial, uh, you know, that you just laid out. Yes. What do you we think to, is going to, share to be... The country with them. We have to share the country exactly. with them. It'd be like if we were, it'd be like if you and I were in a house together and the house was part of the house was on fire and you were like, no, it's not. I'm like, Michael, it's right there. <laughs> it's flame. Right. It's hot. Like, the house me. is gonna burn down. And you're like, no, it's not. Yes. What? No, Who told you that? The media? The media stays lying. Yeah. Like, Michael, we're, we're, we have we're, to we're living in that meme. We're living in that meme of the little dog in the middle of the house, like, this is fine. Like, that's, yeah, no, absolutely. The, the meme when, the counter meme, when they had the the firefighter saving the dog running out of the house, <laughs> when that blew up on the, I was like, yo, I love the internet. Yeah. You see, all right, like, all of us have been around long enough where we've interviewed enough people, whether they're progressives or not, who have, who feel some kind of way about the media, right? So, like, you know, oh, you guys, uh, 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 well, how are you going to portray this? Or you write it any way you want to, and that's not the way it happens. So progressives and conservatives have had issues with the media over the years. I guess I could kind of understand that. What I don't get, and you need to help me with this, what is the end game for conservatives to reject science? What's the end game to see a pandemic, meaning it's happening all over the place, What's the end game to say that's a hoax? What, what, what do you get out of it besides well, sick? You know, some folks have posited that part of why Trump did so well is because he denied that there was a problem in terms of coronavirus. And for many voters, that alone was comforting, and they would rather deal with that comforting notion of it's not that big a deal. And you're talking about people who are not believing or watching CNN and MSNBC, right? They may or may not be watching Fox. And they may or may not be seeing it impact their own world. They may or may not know people in their own circle who have it. So it becomes easy for them to say, it's not real. And if it affects your life, like we're media folks and we're able to live and work on Zoom. But if you are not able to do that, you're a waitress, you work in a hotel, all the sorts of retail jobs that you can't do. I mean, retail and driving things are the two biggest, most populous jobs in America, right? That's what most Americans do, either work in retail or drive things, be it cabs, truckers, limo drivers, what have you. You can't Zoom those things, right? So you're kind of sitting at home, you're unable to make the rent, you're unsure of like what the future is gonna be, and Trump is telling you it's not a big deal. That is a seductive vision for a lot of people. And I think what they get out of being in the bubble is control of those people, right? And I think that um, the notion that knowledge, real knowledge comes from your gut rather than from elites in your head. The left loves academia, 
and elites who are in their head, the right tends to go for homespun knowledge, right? I mean, like, this is very much Sarah Palin's Republican part, right? Like, if Sarah yeah. Palin ran right now and John McCain, God bless the dead, ran right now, John McCain couldn't make it through the first round of the primary, and Sarah Palin would be challenging to win the Republican nomination. Her notion of, like, everything that you need to know is in your gut, that's what the Republican yeah. Party is about. And that's why you get the rejection of science and reality, um, because, you know, we're real Americans. We know what we need to know from what we feel. You said emotional reaction. That's the key phrase. And Michael Smith knows this. I said, look, when Teray comes on, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. But what I'm going to be thinking about the whole time is Prince. Come on. Come with it. You're working on... I, I, I can do a whole... We're going to do a whole show. We're going to have you come back. You're going to come back at three. We're going to go three to five. And we're going to talk about Prince. We're going to talk about Prince. Prince so, but you're working, on, you're working on another Prince book. Is that correct? I am working on another Prince book. It should be out next year. Um, found out some things. Talked to some people who I haven't talked to before. That's my first book. It Ooh, came wow. out a few years ago um, where I talk about the relationship excuse me, between Prince and Generation X and why he was a superstar for, for Generation X. This next book is an oral history uh, describing his life and the things that I've learned about his life. Yo, he used to get beat up in high school every day. They were like, he's a nerd, he's a weirdo. You won't beat him up today or is it my turn to beat him up today? Because somebody's beating him up today because he's a freaking weirdo. Um, the people in high school did not think that he was cool. He hung out in the music room all the time. They thought he dressed weird. And his half-brother, uh, Dwayne, was in the same grade as him, which, of course, everyone thought was weird, right? Your brother is in the same grade as you. Um, and he's tall. He's brown. He's tall. And he could ball. Like, and you're tiny and yellow and you can fall a little bit, but you're tiny. So, you know, Dwayne got all the love and all the respect and Prince got beat up all the time. But after you went home to do your homework, he went to the club and played some more like all night long and then went home mm. and played all night long. I mean, like, you know, he took about 10,000 hours. Prince had his 10,000 hours in by like age 15, 16. Like people mm -hmm. who knew him as a musician were like, yeah. yo, 15, 16, you could see the drive. You could see the ability. He was writing, he was focused. Morris Day talks about, it was Morris Day lived around the corner. He talks about Prince, 15, 16 years old, knocking on his door at midnight. 1 a.m., 3 a.m., yo, I just came up with a song, I gotta record it, because Morris had a four-track recorder, Prince did not, and if you didn't open the door, he's going around to the side, he's going around to the back, <laughs> like, you Morris. owe him money, like, yo, you got to open let me the get him. I love it. Right now. <laughs> I love it. How many, how many instruments, by the way, how many instruments officially did he, well, uh, did he it, master? Well, well, you know, we can put a number on it, it's somewhere in the high teens, but ultimately... You know, Questlove is like, there's there's only a certain number of instrument families, right? And if you can play music, then you can, you know, like, you can play this, you mm. can play it, like, so we right. count, oh, Clarinet, man, saxophone, yeah. Questlove, like, that's not, Prince could do everything except uh, the horn instruments, and that's only because to play a horn, you got to have the embouchure. You got to mess up your lips, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that takes years to develop. And I think he probably didn't want to mess up his lips so he could have the look and how he could, and he could sing a little bit better. But he could play anything. And this is by his teens that he could play anything. And like bass, guitar, drums at an elite level. I mean, all these are things things that take years and years to master. People struggle to master one of them. He mastered all of them at an elite level. Um, but the thing that he thought was his best talent was songwriting. That's where he thought that he, that's the thing he thought he did best, that he put so much energy and attention into the poetry of the songwriting. That's what he thought was his best talent. Tore is elite.
at talking about everything. I told you. That's that. right. Um, you know, we, we still got, we still got. There you go. Uh, yeah. Do yourself a favor, man. We appreciate you. I'm telling the audience, do yourself a favor and subscribe to Torres Podcast. Everybody from Lawrence O'Donnell. This, oh, this is his range in a nutshell. His last two guests were Lawrence O'Donnell and Jeezy. Okay, <laughs> he's at Lynn Whitfield, Corey Bush, Corey Booker, Jamie Harrison. That's just in his last ten guests. His podcast is incredible. All your work is incredible. Your knowledge, man. Thank you so much for falling through. Let's and do the, it again the, soon, the all right? This episode was legendary. Bro, I'm just glad oh, to be on the list. He can't call his own play, though. He can't He can't mention himself there. I, he needs, I was he just glad to be on the list. You remember that, Torrey, where we could be in person, when I could come to your studio? Remember those days? You Yo, know? Oh, we did that in person, bro. That feels like forever ago. Damn. I know, man. Thank you for coming through, though, man. We appreciate it. Let's do this again, all right? I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. Really nice to hang out with you guys. Thank you. The Prince, All right, brother, man. The Prince episode.